open your Bibles this morning. Romans, Romans chapter 1, and also put something in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and also put something in Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17. We've been looking at the six pillars in the book of Romans, and just by way of remembrance, the six pillars began with Pauline authority, understanding that Paul is our apostle. It's in the book of Romans for the very first time that God said, I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. So understanding that Paul is our apostle is of the utmost authority as we study our Bibles in this day and age. Secondly, in Romans 1.18 to chapter 3 and verse 20, uh, the content, the pillar is the human race condemned. We need to understand our standing before God in this world as we're born in Adam, that God doesn't look favorably upon the human race. God has a testimony concerning the human race, and it's not a pleasant one. And we've looked at that. And then in Romans 3.21 to chapter 5, verse 21, is the great pinnacle Pauline doctrine of justification by faith. The only place in your Bible that you'll find that your salvation is a free gift, that you don't do anything to earn or deserve, that you receive freely by grace through faith in Jesus Christ is in Paul's epistles. Justification by faith, the most important doctrine in the entire universe today. And then the doctrine of sanctification, that through the word of God we're set apart from the way we used to be to the way we're becoming. A progressive thing. Not anything that happens overnight by any stretch of the imagination. I believe every Christian knows that and understands that for, for a fact. And then also uh, the doctrine of glorification, our ultimate destiny in eternity in the ages to come when we're glorified with Christ and in heaven. And then the doctrine of dispensationalism, Romans chapter 9, 9, 10, and 11, explaining what happened to Israel and why God is not done with them but has temporarily set them apart or set them aside for the time being while the dispensation of grace is arriving and coming to its conclusion. And then also... Now we're in the, uh, under the heading of the human race condemned. We have been under that heading now for uh, several weeks and probably will be for a couple more weeks, a couple meaning 10, 12 <laughs> weeks. It's not a short subject by any stretch of the imagination. Last week, uh, oh, the, the title of this message, by the way, is Professing Themselves to be Wise, They Became Fools. Last week, uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And last week, we looked at the invisible things of him from the creation of the world that are clearly seen, and we looked at his eternal power and Godhead. We looked at those, the things that create manifested his omniscience, his omnipresence, but even more importantly, his omnipotence, his eternal power. And last week, we looked at uh, Psalm 90, that from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God, and from vanishing point to vanishing point, thou art God. And we looked at the eternality of God, and you know we went east and west and north and south, and we even discovered the Higgs boson particle, which was really cool. I really enjoyed studying that out. And then, um, as we continue in Romans 1, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. And I ended last week by saying that verse 20 
had strategically been placed in the book of Romans exactly where it is by the Holy Spirit and it was there to make a contrast between the eternal God and his fallen creature. And I don't suppose that it could be clearer or a broader contrast could be drawn between the eternal God and man as he is. In verse 21, we read, because that when they knew God, and they knew God, they knew who God was, because God is described in the previous verse, the God whose eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen because of the things that he made, because of the creation. That God was worthy of human worship and adoration. But is that what they did? Is that what men did? Nope. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Here's a God who creates the perfect environment for man to dwell in, to dwell in. He places man in this place, and he provides everything that he needs for his survival. Not just morsels that he doles out by the spoonful, but he provides for man an overabundance of everything that man needs. Fruits, vegetables, water, air, mercy, forgiveness, long-suffering, patience. Everything that man needs is provided by God. And men should have been thankful to God. But the apostle says in verse 21, neither were thankful. That's a, a plague upon the human race, unthankfulness. We see that a lot, even more so today than we ever have, unthankfulness. So neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations. When men forget God, when men think that they're wiser than God, they become vain. They become vain as in empty and worthless even and having no substance, no value, no importance. The petty things of time become more important than the weighty matters of eternity. When men turn their backs on God, their foolish heart was darkened. Rather than recognize the light of creation, rather than recognize the light of the eternal witness that God places inside of every man and every woman that is born into this world, rather than recognize that, their foolish heart was darkened. And that's what kind of heart rejects the clear revelation that God exists. A heart that has been darkened. You want to know why the world is the way it is? You want to know why greed and lascivious, lasciviousness run rampant in our world today? You want to know why every man is out for himself, totally disregarding the well-being of anyone around him? You want to know why we've had two world wars in this century alone? and countless other war wars also after that. You want to know why the world is heading almost towards total annihilation and destruction of itself? You want to know why? Because man's heart is darkened, and he has no desire for God, and he doesn't want God in his life, and he doesn't want his children to know about God, and he doesn't want anything to do about God, and he doesn't want to think about God. That's why the world is the way it is. Rather than acknowledge the only wise God, like Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, now unto the King eternal, invisible, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, to honor and glory for uh, be honor and glory forever and ever. Er amen. Because their heart was darkened. They not only were not able to say this, but the ultimate manifestation of self-deception is verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, 
they became fools. Let me tell you something before we, we look at this verse and the implications that are found in this verse. Only the Holy Ghost would have dared write that verse. And not only that, only the Holy Ghost would have known to write that verse. Because that's not what men think about themselves, and that's not what men say about themselves either, is it? But when men forsake the only wise God, when they forsook him and dethroned him, and then set themselves up on the throne, this is what they began to think about themselves. And in doing this, they really demonstrated, really, how much fools they really are. This is not just something, by the way, that guilty ancient men were guilty of. Men in, you know, after Adam and the first chapters of Genesis. This is the curse of today's society. You know, from the beginning of time until this very day today, men have thought themselves to be wiser than God. But isn't that what the serpent said to Eve? Isn't that what he said to her? A tree to make one wise, he said. And she bought into that. And her children have bought into that. Hook, line, and sinker. Lock, stock, and barrel. And today, Adam's fallen children, who are not saved, are 100% bona fide, verified, card-carrying fools if they profess themselves to be wiser than God. This is not my testimony against them. This is God's testimony against them. Okay? Notice that. They profess themselves to be wise. This is a self-proclamation. Okay? They claim to be wise. It's their own wisdom. It's no wonder we're in such a mess today. Notice they profess. I don't suppose that this truth could be demonstrated more vividly and with more clarity than the universities of the world today. Every university has professors. And what do professors do? Oh, they profess. <laughs> That's what professors do. They profess to be wise. And who could help but notice the nonsense and the foolishness that comes out of these schools of higher learning today? But the sad thing is this. It's not just secular colleges. It's Bible colleges as well. Young men and women leave their hometown, their home churches, to go away to a school, a Bible school, where they really should be able to trust. I mean, after all, it's a Bible school. Surely you'll go there and get the best education there is, right? But that's not what happens. They don't go there and learn the Bible. They go there and they learn and they're taught that Mark 16 doesn't really belong in the Bible. They're taught that 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. They're taught that that verse isn't in the original. It doesn't belong in the Bible. And they attack the triune God. And God himself is attacked by them. The King James Bible is ridiculed in every Bible college in the United States and around the world today. And the new satanic perversions are heralded as the best and the most accurate translations, even though the blood of Jesus Christ has been removed from very salient verses in the Bible. And then the, the, those poor kids leave those schools wondering if there is even a God. And then they have no respect for the word of God whatsoever. And all of that at the hands of men who claim and profess to be wise. Some of them think they're wiser than God. 
When men think that they're wiser than God, you know that they've bought into the biggest line of baloney that has ever been hatched in the incubators of hell. The very first mention of the word wise is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. As we mentioned a few moments ago, Eve bought into this lie. Adam bought into this lie. And because they disobeyed God, all of Adam's children have bought into this lie. That's the first mention of wise in your King James Bible. The second mention of wise is in connection with Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 8. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. So the magicians and all the wise men, that verse says, that was worldly wisdom. This was not the wisdom of God. This was, this was the wisdom and learning of Egypt. But it says that there was none that could interpret the dream. And then in Genesis chapter 41, Pharaoh's chief butler remembered that he had been put in prison. And while he was there, there was a young man, a Hebrew, who uh, remembered, and in, not remembered, but was able to tell them their dream and interpret their dream. So Pharaoh called for Joseph. And Joseph told Pharaoh the dream that he dreamt and then gave him the interpretation of that dream. And in Genesis 41, 39, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. That was godly wisdom. So there is worldly wisdom, which isn't wisdom at all. And then there's godly wisdom. In the last part of uh, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, according to the Lord Jesus Christ, said, cease from thine own wisdom. Cease from your own wisdom. That's good advice. Now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Chapters 1 and 3 of 1 Corinthians have been my favorite chapters probably since I have been saved. In these three chapters, the wisdom of the world is contrasted with the wisdom of God, especially the wisdom of God as it's found in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul begins to preach about the cross of Jesus Christ in verse 17, he introduces an attitude about preaching that everyone should take heed to. Notice verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, he elaborates on this concept in chapter 2 and verse 1. Notice, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He didn't come with them thinking he was some big, you know, as educated as he was. He didn't promote that in his, in his preaching. 
Verse 2, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Now, I love these verses because something happened right before Paul penned these words that is very important. Turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. This is where Paul went to Athens. And he was confronted by the philosophers on Mars Hill. In Acts chapter 17, notice verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him, and they took him, um, and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Now, this scene takes place in Athens, Greece. Athens is known throughout the world for its philosophers and its philosophy. Athens, Greece is the shrine where human wisdom was worshipped. They bowed down to the philosophers. But Paul was not a man like other men. While he waited in Athens, and he looked upon the gods and the goddesses that lined the streets of, of, of Athens, I mean, it was said of Athens that it was easier to find a god than to find a man. And Paul was in the midst of all of this, and the Bible says that his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Not an idol here and there, not a statue here and there. The whole city was entirely given to this idolatry. That represented man's wisdom. And what did Paul do? Notice Acts 17, 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Now Paul spent some time in Athens. Because notice it says that in the verse, daily with them. He was there for a while in Athens. And naturally, Paul... Being there for a while began to get the attention of some of the people and some of the uh, more well-known people. As a matter of fact, look down in verse 18, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. You see what these philosophers called him? They called him a babbler. What will this babbler say? A babbler is an idle talker, an irrational, rambling babbler. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just rambling on and on and on about things that we don't understand. That's what a babbler is. Someone who has nothing to say. In other words, these philosophers looked down condescendingly upon Paul, had a very low opinion of him, and thought not him to be nothing. That's, that's what this, is, this word means. You know what's sad? 
even in Christianity today, many denominations have that same low opinion of the apostle to the Gentiles. Who's Paul? I remember a long time ago when I was first saved, ran to two, I was in uh, Sam's in Fort Lauderdale, or a store like Sam's, and ran into these two little ladies, two uh, elderly ladies, and while we were there, I, I don't know how I started talking to them, but I started talking to them. We started talking about the Bible. And they were putting forth things. And I said, you know what we should do? We should let me go home with you guys. We'll talk about it. They said, come on over. <laughs> so I went. I followed them home. Okay. Well, when we got there, I constantly, every time they said something, I was in, in somewhere in Paul's epistles, re rebuking, rebutting, whatever it was. I don't remember the whole conversation. But at one point, the daughter, it was a mother and daughter, the daughter said, why are you always quoting Paul? She got angry. She got upset that I was always quoting Paul. Because they were quoting everywhere else except Paul. I didn't even know I was rightly dividing at that point, but I was. But denominations have a very low opinion of the man that they should hold in the highest esteem. He said, I magnify mine office. That should be what we're doing too, okay? But you see, you see in this verse why they called him a babbler. Notice the last, last words of the, of the verse. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. You know what he preached? He preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and he had not even written 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 yet. Those, that book wasn't even written in Acts chapter 17. The cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection was Paul's birthplace. Paul was saved by the cross. He was justified by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul never looked at the cross as a religious artifact that you were supposed to hang around your neck. That's not how he ever spoke of the cross. He never spoke about the wood of the cross. He spoke about the work of the cross. He spoke of the redemption that's found in the cross. He spoke of the reconciliation that is available to those who believe in the work of the cross. He spoke of the peace that came through the cross to those who were purchased by the blood on the cross. Paul never thought of the cross as a religious artifact hanging on somebody's wall with some man on it with a few drops of blood strategically placed on his wrist and on his feet. The cross was much more to Paul than that. It was much more to Paul than him just suffering physically in pain and agony. Yes, he suffered in shame and in extreme pain. But that was not the worst part of the cross for Jesus Christ. The worst part of the cross for Jesus Christ was he that knew no sin was made sin for you. The worst part of the cross is that Jesus Christ, who had never sinned, was all of a sudden filled with all of the sin of mankind on him at one time. The skin of his body filled with sin. The guilt, the shame. He felt it all in one instantaneous moment of time. And as bad as that was, that still wasn't the worst part of the cross. The worst part of the cross 
is when he hung on that cross and God the Father had to pour out upon him the full, unmitigated fury of his eternal wrath on his own son. Why would God have to do that? Why would God have to pour out his wrath in anger on his son? Because the wages of sin is death. And Jesus Christ took the penalty for your sin. And he died your death. He died in your place. You were the one who was supposed to die. I was the one who was supposed to die. But Jesus Christ took our place on the cross. And now here's Paul in the midst of Athens. And what does he preach? He preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And because he did, the verse says, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange God. But how can that be? Are not these the greatest minds who have ever, ever graced planet Earth? I mean, this is where Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, men who had already lived and died, and these men who were here, the Epicureans and the Stoics, were following in their footsteps. These men had reached the pinnacle of human reasoning and logic and had achieved the highest levels of intellectual capabilities the world has ever known and in their august wisdom and knowledge they fig they never figured out how to be reconciled unto God after all they were lovers of wisdom that's what philosophy means lover of wisdom you know why they didn't know about God's plan of redemption in Christ because professing themselves to be wise they became fools and rather than believe what Paul was preaching notice in verse 19 they took him and brought him unto Areopagus saying May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? Notice the verse says, and they took him. They took him. You know, Paul was a little guy. Paul, that's what Paul means, small. He was a totally, totally unpretentious looking man. Definitely not the guy you would think would walk into a city and confront the philosophers of Greece. <laughs> Somebody wrote, uh, his letters are powerful, but his presence is weak. And I can only imagine these men must have been brutes. Come on, sonny boy. And he didn't have a choice. You see... It was illegal in Athens to believe in any other God than that which had been set up by them. That was illegal. It was a crime. That's why they said, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. And this was a big deal to them. So they took him to Areopagus. Areopagus means the hill of Mars. It was the sovereign tribunal of Athens it was the highest court in the land in that day 300 years before this event in Acts chapter 17 Socrates had been brought into the same court and for the same reason that Paul was being brought there this time they had accused Socrates and rightfully so, of not believing in the gods of the Athenians. Socrates was brought before the high tri tribunal, and Socrates was found guilty and sentenced to death. His sentence, that he was to drink a cup of hemlock, which he did publicly and died very soon thereafter. It's said of Socrates that 
He drank the cup. And he did it proudly. And right before he died, he told one of his protégés, make sure you pay back that thing that you owe that guy. Right before he died. Paul was brought before the same court. And they gave him an opportunity to explain what he was preaching. Notice. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. I believe you believe too many wrong things. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. I mean, you think of this. The greatest minds the world has ever known, they had gods for every occasion and for every superstition. And in creating these gods, they came up with this brilliant idea. What if? What if we missed one? I mean, is it possible that we could have missed one? They must have said that to themselves. If there's another one, we certainly don't want to offend him. So, hey. Let's do this. We'll make an altar, and we'll put an idol on it, and we'll name him the unknown God. And when they did that, they acknowledged and proved and validated and substantiated this. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Just think of the apostle of the Gentiles as he looks at these people who think they're wise. Just think. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of hard to imagine Paul, who has been receiving revelation of Jesus Christ, which was progressive. He said, I will come to revelations of the Lord. Here's a man that Jesus Christ has been teaching personally and he looks at this debauchery these people that are lost who think they're something what what must he have felt because Paul was a compassionate man keep your finger here and in first Corinthians remember I said when we were looking at first Corinthians that something happened before Notice again, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And then again, he elaborates, 1 Corinthians 2, 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified, and I was with you, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Okay, and when we read these verses a while ago, I said something happened before Paul wrote these words. Something happened. Look back in Acts chapter 17. Paul had this experience on Mars Hill, confronted the philosophers. And after that experience, notice chapter 18, verse 1. And after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. While this incident was still fresh on his mind, not an experience that one can just brush off easily. You've just confronted the most intellectual, highly acclaimed intellectual people in the world, and you've proven to them that they're just fools. He had just showed a lot of people that they were wrong. And it was at a time when everyone in the city was against him. One man against him.
against Athens, Greece. You don't just remember, you don't just forget something like that. I remember a time in my life something similar to that happened. I did not confront the philosophers in Athens, Greece. <clears throat> but I did confront a group of construction workers who gave no thought to God or about God. It was a hot summer day in Fort Lauderdale. And Don Cody was with me, my buddy. from He was there that day. And uh, I had this Bible right here. I've had that since I was saved. It's a full King James Bible, Genesis to Revelation. I kept that in my back pocket for years. Huh? Yeah, large print. Yeah, it's small now. It was, it was okay then, but it's small now. And this day, for some reason, this was a huge construction site. It's called King's Point, right outside of Margate, Florida. They were building 10,000 apartments. 10,000, okay? And it was two apartments on the bottom, two on the top, and all metal stud framing because it was all concrete slabs. And I'll never forget this day, for some reason, all the electricians, all the plumbers, all the framers, all the drywall guys, all the tile guys, all the bathroom guys, all the kitchen guys, I don't know why, they all came to this one place and everybody was sitting there eating. Some were sitting on the stairs that went up. Some were sitting on buckets. And I, I was just walking by there. I don't know what, where I was, but I noticed all those guys, right? Well, I don't know what came over me, but I took up my Bible out of my pocket. I said, listen up. And I started preaching. And I started preaching about that the, the day of the Lord was coming, that there was an event called a rapture, and only people who had trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior were going to go in that rapture. And if you didn't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were staying behind for the Antichrist, and you were in big trouble, and if you think you're smart. And I preached for 15 minutes. He, my buddy Don was there. He was the whole thing. I just, man, there was a guy sitting there with full bologna sandwich in him. Just like that. And I preached. And when I was done, I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. And I walked away. About two, three, four days later, I don't remember exactly how long, this guy came up to me. And he said, hey, Rodney, I want you to know that when you preached the other day, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And then months later, months later, Somebody had gone to, I think it was a Billy Graham crusade in Miami, Florida, from our church where I was going. And he came up to me on Sunday morning. He said, Rodney, I ran into a guy at the Billy Graham crusade who said he got saved when you were preaching on a construction site in, Fort, in, in Margate. I said, no kidding, I know him. Yeah, I remember him. He goes, yeah, he is excited. I said, well, praise the Lord. I never forgot that because that was a huge, I was like confronting the philosopher. I mean, you should have seen these guys. I mean, these are, some of these guys, you don't just go up to them and start talking about the Lord. You know, you're not, you normally you would think, but I did. And I just preached like it was going out of style. Uh, Paul did that here. That's what Paul did. Paul never forgot that experience he had on Mars Hill. He never forgot that. He met at Athens the, mo the proudest, most arrogant, and even the most eloquent men, most high-minded, most conceited men. And now, after that event, he comes to Corinth, right there. He comes to Corinth. Corinth at this time is now a bustling city was a relatively new city because 146 years before Christ, a man named Consul Mumius burned Corinth to the ground. And then before Jesus Christ came into the world, Julius Caesar rebuilt Corinth and repopulated it. 
and colonized it. And by the time Paul arrived in Corinth, it was a flourishing city. People would sail there from every point in the world to get to Rome out here. And they would sail out here, and they would sail into the Itmus at Corinth. Some of them, depending on the size of the ship, would actually drag their ship across the Isthmus and write down and drop it right down into, into this little channel here and sail out here and then sail up to Rome. Sail up to Italy and then to Rome. Some of them would unload their ships and carry all the cargo across and reload another ship and take, rather than have to sail all the way around here. They would cut across here. There were people from every language and place in the world, rich and poor, male and female, everything was there. When they say that Corinth, Corinth was filled with debauchery and lewdness and sin, they were not joking. You could live somewhere else, and if you were not living an upright life, they called you a Corinthian. You Corinthian. In Corinth, they had temples consecrated to their sin. They had temple prostitutes and everything else to go with it. You take Miami, San Francisco, Las Vegas, combine them together with not one iota of Christian influence, and you have Corinth. And throw Athens, Greece into that mix too. Throw them all in. And here comes Saul of Tarsus, the mighty apostle to the Gentiles. Okay. Paul. But he's not going to act like them. He's not going to be like them or talk like them. He said, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, unlike the philosophers that I just left. Remember, that's fresh in his mind, fresh in his thinking. He probably still has a few scars from where they, you're coming with us. He said, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, because everything else is valueless. Everything else is pointless. Everything else is vanity. I determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul preached in Athens, Jesus and the resurrection. And he certainly wasn't going to hold his shoulders back raise his head like he's balancing the family tree on his nose and walk into Corinth as though he has all the answers and God sent him like you see your TV evangelists doing today when they come prancing on the platform and their people applaud them when they come on, which I've seen happening more than once. A preacher coming into church and the people are applauding him. Paul said, and I was with you in weakness, recognizing his own frailty and inability and his dependence and reliance upon God. And in fear, in fear, and in much trembling. What a great pattern for preachers and Christians alike. He said the same thing in verse 17, for our Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Not with wisdom of words, so men could look at him and say, wow, look how brilliant he is. That exalts the man. That lifts the man up. Paul was interested in getting the message across so that it could be understood, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You know, when the cross of Christ is made of none effect, do you know when that happens? When those who believe that the wisdom of this world is above the preaching of the cross 
or those who think that their message is above the message of the cross through their high-mindedness, it nullifies the word of God. Notice verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. We've all met people who think that the preaching of the cross is foolishness. You've all met people like that. That's how the world looks at the cross, isn't it? Look at 1 Corinthians 1.25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The things of God, which seem to be foolishness to men, is much higher than men's highest thought. Man, in his wisdom, thinks the message of the cross is foolishness. What will God do to that man's wisdom? 1 Corinthians 1.19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. I mean, think about that. What is man's wisdom? What is man's wisdom in the eyes of the omniscient, all-knowing God? Verse 1 Corinthians 3.18, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. You know how you become wise? You become a fool in the eyes of the world by admiring and cherishing and valuing what God cherishes and values. That's how you become a fool in the eyes of the world. You believe the, you believe the message of the cross. You have to become a fool in the eyes of the world to believe the message of the cross. That's when you know you're wise, when you have believed God's message. That's when you know. If the world thinks that your Christian message is great, if the world comes flocking to your church and sings your praises about what you're saying, and you have 10, 15,000 people that come flocking to hear you, you're preaching the wrong message. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written... He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise. What? That they are vain. Imagine thinking that you're wise only to find out in the end that you're actually a fool. (laughs) I mean, isn't that what we started saying today, Romans chapter 1, professing themselves to be wise? They became fools. God's analysis of men, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? God says, where is the wise? Where is your Greek philosopher? Are any of them really wise? In all their learning, were they able to find God? Well, the highest they ever got to was an inscription to the unknown God. That's the best they did. Where is the scribe? That's your Jewish scholar. With all of your religion, were they any closer to God? Paul records the fall of Israel and the diminishing of Israel. They, had, they didn't find it either. They rejected it. They rejected the wisdom of God, which is Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. Where is the disputer of this world? That would be your Roman, intellectually capable of disputing anything. These three classes of people, the the Greek, the Roman, and the Jewish religion had merged in the crossroads of time, all at one point. The Greeks with their philosophers, the Jews with their corrupted religion, and the Romans with the might and power of the Roman army. All of them existed as Paul is penning these words. 
But what does God say of, about them? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, in the wisdom of God means that when God looked down, when God saw everything that man had accomplished on his own, when God saw how high and mighty man thought he was in his own eyes and that the highest attainment he had ever achieved was an altar to the unknown God. After that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. When God saw that the world by wisdom knew not God, when God allowed the greatest minds to ever live, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates had already lived and died, and the world was none the better because they had been here. When God allowed that to happen, when God saw that they could not pierce through the mysteries of religion and understand salvation and how to be right with God, when God saw that, when God left them sitting in the dust of their own ignorance, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Then and only then did it please God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That was God's masterstroke of genius when he let allowed the greatest minds in the universe to fall flat on their face when it came to spiritual things and really in their wisdom proved that they were ignorance. Then he sent Paul to them with a revelation of a secret that had been hidden God for ages and for generations, something that could never have been known apart from the supernatural divine revelation of God himself, and he revealed it to Paul, and he sent Paul in their midst to preach the gospel. And when he went, he preached Jesus and the resurrection. The gospel of the grace of God, something that had never been dreamt of, never thought of, never imagined by the greatest minds in the universe. And God sends Paul to them, my hero. In verse 6, howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. Paul didn't speak the wisdom of the world when he went to them, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. A mystery in the Bible is not uh, Hercule Poirot trying to solve a, mis a crime, the great mystery, who, who done it? It's not. A mystery in the Bible is something that was kept secret by God until he, de de until he decided to reveal it. Paul says we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. It was hidden God and it was before the world. While these great philosophers were trying to find the secret to life and peace with God, any God they could invent, there was a secret that was hidden God that they could never figure it out because professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's the world we live in. Now, if you believe this message, if you believe the message of the cross, you have become a fool, but you're the right kind of fool. See, that's what Paul said, we're fools for Christ. In the eyes of the world, we're fools, but ultimately, the table is turned. It's they who think they're wise are fools. We who they think are fools are wise in Christ. Because that's what Paul says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, Paul says, 
but of him are ye in Christ, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. That's the wisdom you want. That's what you want. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I pray today that anyone who would hear the words of this message, would realize that their worldly wisdom will come to naught. And God will, will catch the world in their own wisdom and in their own craftiness. I pray today that everyone listening would become a fool in the eyes of the world to become wise with God by believing that Jesus Christ died was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And by simple faith in that finished work and trusting that, God will save them. We pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.